Lovely. Um, I'm going to, so I'm going to just begin briefly by introducing myself. Um, so, uh, hi, my name is Benji. Uh, uh, I debated predominantly with the Israeli circuit uh, for quite a few years. I currently live uh, in London temporarily. That's my beautiful background of Tower Bridge. Um, and amongst other things, I was DCA of Euros, uh, of Euros Athens and did various other things as well. Uh, and I'm like sort of just happy to uh, uh, come and help out here. Uh, we ran as part of the build up to Athens, we ran a series of uh, workshops uh, all, over, all over the world. And one of the workshops that we did there was really on extensions and closing half strategy, uh, which is kind of what I'm gonna get into today. Um, so there's the ability to send questions both in the Discord channel and here in, in chat. Uh, I would prefer, if possible, if people would send it in the chat in the Zoom here. Um, that also has the added benefit of those those questions are then recorded uh, as part of the Zoom as part of the Zoom meeting, so that when we share them, people looking at this uh, can have context. Um, if people want to now begin with maybe just writing in the chat what it is that they were hoping to get out of this session. Um, that would be a good thing. And I'll make sure that if we haven't covered that by the end of the session uh, while going through, that I do take a moment, like take a moment or two to answer people's questions specifically. Hopefully we were painting with a broad enough brush that most people's questions get answered naturally. That will may mean that the presentation was built well. Um, and also if during the session as well, you have additional questions or stuff that you want to ask, uh, please do throw them into the chat and I'll try and, uh, I'll try and address them there. Um, if I find that it's difficult just because like technologically jumping between the chat and the, the presentation proves too difficult for me, I might just get them to at the end, but please don't be frustrated. You're not being ignored. I'm just being stupid. Um, so I am, people joining, lovely. I am going to begin now. So I'm going to share. Um, da, 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 da. Um, for those of just joining us, uh, I asked if people wanted to use the chat to post questions, they're more than welcome to. Uh, and I will try and have a look at them as we go through. Um, and also just to please note that even if I don't manage to answer your questions while during the presentation, uh, I will try and get to them at the end as well. Uh, so please do bear with me. Um, lovely. So I am going to begin. I assume everyone can now see the uh, screen. If you could just give me a little emojis telling me with a thumbs up and everything that you can see the presentation, that'll be great. Lovely. Thanks, friends. Cool. So extensions and closing half strategy. Uh, so as I mentioned, I, uh, like, I'm Benji. I'm doing this part of the uh, Madrid uh, WDC 2023 bid online development week. Um, it's important for me to note here in this presentation, like all great things in, uh, <laughs> in debating and in the world, this is really something which has been built on by like a bunch of different people, ideas and sessions that, that I've either worked with people on or have been given to me. So Eitan, Sela, Yoni and Miller all had like a lot to do with this presentation and like very much thanks to them. Uh, for helping uh, for helping craft and put this together. Um, closing strategy. So let's sort of go into this. So <laughs> it's uh, fun to kind of start with the quote of what it is that uh, closing strategy is supposed to mean. And the things that are kind of really important for me to stress here inside the judging manual is the idea that this we want to be going beyond what's already been said and that it can't only be the most minimal of extensions. Um, and we'll touch upon both of these two things throughout this session, both what beyond means and also what is more than just only the most minimal and how we kind of make sure that we do that. The reason it's kind of good to go back to the judging manual itself is that very often this is the kind of stuff that people are pointed towards. Uh, yeah, like judges and everything like that going through this. So often go and look at the manual, try and understand what's going on and trying to see what, what's kind of happening there. So it's important for us to kind of always remember what it is actually the rules of the game are telling us. So the first thing, different doesn't mean necessarily beyond. And this is something that a lot of people kind of make a mistake to make. And I'll, I'll go over this a couple of times in the presentation, but it is not enough to simply have a different extension right? It needs to actually be better in some kind of metric than what has already been said. And this is the first kind of places where people get confused. They're like, but I had an extension because I said something different. 
cool, correct, that's unlikely to be a willing, winning extension in and of itself. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to contribute unique and persuasive responses versus piggybacking on what it is that our opening has already done. And it's worth just taking a moment now to remember that a lot of times the biggest threat to what's happening in closing is simply what happens in opening. And the better our opening is, the more difficult it becomes for us to kind of deal with what's going to happen. So this is basically all of what this session is gonna try and talk to us about. How do we be different? How do we go beyond? And how do we become unique and persuasive and not just relying on what's come ahead of us? So in this, I'm gonna be talking, we're gonna to run to two different things here. I'm gonna be talking about closing strategy during prep as in what is it, which is the slide which is coming up now, i.e. what are the kind of general notes that I can give you in order to prepare to be as best strategically possible inside your closing, inside your closing. So it's how to use those 15 minutes as effectively as possible. And the second and the much longer part is how we do this during the debate itself, the strategy about what we do during the debate and the different types of extensions that we can choose to take and for each of those different extensions, we're gonna talk about what it is that you need to do in order to run them, when you should run them, and what is, it, what is the dangers of doing them as well. Note that the second half is much longer than the first part because preparation time is 15 minutes and the debate is almost like another 45 minutes until you get up there to speak to an hour. That's why most of the strategy of, of closing doesn't happen in prep, it does happen It does happen during the debate, but a good prep session means that you'll be able to use those 45 minutes as effectively as possible. Cool, so let's go into what it means to be actually doing this inside prep. So the first thing, and this is really, really important, is don't rush. And by this, I mean a few things. So first of all, don't feel pressured that you need to finish your, pre your prep with the winning best case possible. Your preparation doesn't end at 15 minutes. Your preparation ends as you get up there to speak, i.e. 45 minutes after that fact. So you need to be much, much, much more concentrating, not on having the best case possible, not on rushing to understand exact, rushing to immediately get to the best case, but taking your time to do uh, to make sure that you both have an understanding of what the debate is about and where it is likely to go. And by that, I mean, you wanna be really looking and saying, okay, this is the debate. This is what likely OG are gonna say. Oh, oh, are likely gonna say, uh, oh, are likely gonna say this. These are the kind of open questions which are likely to sort of remain at the end of, like at the end of the speech. Have a, diff a tree of different possibilities of where it is the debate could go and what it would be, would, what it would be worth like to kind uh, uh, to concentrate your time on during the debate. I, you don't want one strategy. You want to kind of one case. You want to have a good idea of three or four different strategies that you might run given what happens in the debate. And you need to have this level of flexibility and not rush into a conception of exactly what the debate will be like and exactly what the winning case will be because there's just so much uncertainty that happens before. Okay, so what you wanna be aiming to try and get to is really, and what you wanna be talking about during prep is here is a chart of the different ways that the debate could go. And here are the different types of cases. You don't need to run through every logical link. You don't need to have every single thing kind of in, involved in that. You have more time to do that during the debate, but you should have a clearer picture of what's sort of happening here. And this is really important. Don't expect any of your prep material to necessarily survive opening. Be prepared to change the extension by deputy if necessary. So this is another thing, and this is, goes back to the don't rush. When we get into this conception of exactly what's gonna happen in the debate or exactly what our case should be, and then opening just run it or run something which is close enough, we're left without a lot of options, right? And we don't necessarily know what to do. And that's when people begin panicking during extensions. Whereas if we have a much broader picture to paint from, it's much more easy for us to kind of understand what the choices are that we should make during the debate itself. So this is summing up everything that has to do with, with how we prepare for to do this necessarily. What do we then do during the debate itself? 
So the first point here is listen. And the most common mistake that I found that's been created by most people who I, who end up who I end up seeing uh, who I end up seeing debating is that they haven't actually listened to what their opening has said. This or what the or either their own opening or the other or their diagonal. Most of the time, it has to do they're not listening enough to what's being said by their opening because they listen to the diagonal because they want to know how to respond, but they're not appreciating the fact that. If they don't listen to their opening, then stuff, then most of the time, their case won't be relevant. By the way, I found this to be doubly problematic in Zoom times, i.e. COVID times, because audio is more shit. So it's more difficult to listen and hear what's being said by somebody. And also because it's more difficult to stay alert and concentrate on a, on a, on a computer screen than it is somebody talking. So more and more and more, I've seen that people are not listening during, during their opening speeches. And what that leads to is they're simply coming up with extensions or like new responses, which are literally word for word what's already been said. So... The other thing here is never underestimate your opening. And by this, I mean, and again, going back to the fact that you're not really listening properly to what's being said, you might have missed a few things. You might have not necessarily understood. Getting up there and using all kinds of phrases like opening never proved X, opening have never talked about Y. All of these things, most of the time when people have said them, I check my notes and I see their opening has talked about X. Their opening did mention Y and they weren't really listening. And this means goes back to this idea of not underestimating your opening, i.e. if it's possible that they said something or it's possible that they made their case in a way which is slightly better than what you heard it, err uh, on the side of caution. Assume that potentially they did say this obvious thing that you're thinking about or that their response was slightly better than what you're giving it credit to so that you can build off that. Minimizing and marginalizing your opening team isn't going to get you by good judges. They will know what your opening has said, and you will look like fools for having not listened to them properly or, for, or trying to pretend that they haven't said things when they really have. Know who you are most threatened by. So I've talked a lot about the opening here, but to be clear, your opening isn't necessarily always your biggest threat. It's just in order to meet that minimum bar of like having a new extension, we need to be listening to them so that we can have something new to say in the debate. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're your biggest threat. And you need to be able to be judging what is happening during the debate to know who it is that you need to be preparing your case to go against. A lot of this happens in WIP. And we'll talk about this in the roles of the speakers that and it's whip's role to really be judging the debate as it happens. And as a whip, I basically approach the debate and my note taking in the exact same way I do as a judge, in the way that I flow a debate, in the way that I decide who's like which side of the house is winning, which clashes and everything. And I know that at every, any given point during the debate, and that is the kind of thing that you'll be able to know. And it, that's the kind of thing that you'll want to be able to do in order to make the strategic decisions of how you extend and how you then frame that extension in order to win. So, sorry, this is the point that I've just sort of talked about, which is taking notes and judges. And for people who haven't judged yet, but are doing whip speeches, I really recommend judging quite a few rounds, noting how the note, your note taking is, and then trying to incorporate that into your, the way that you take notes as whip. All right, this will give you kind of an understanding of where you want to be and what the understanding is. And just so you know, again, as judges, you want to be knowing as judges or as a whip at any given point in time who might be winning the debate. It's not good enough to simply know that at the very end and doing all of your calculations, you're very likely to not be able to get to the right decision in time. This is true for whip. This is true for judges. Finally, good interactions throughout the debate. And that I mean between the partners. So note what's kind of happened here. We've sort of got to three different things. We've had a good understanding between myself and my partner before going into the debate. So we we weren't just like fixated on one single strategy or one sort of thing to go, but we had multiple avenues to pursue, which we both understood preliminarily what it was. So then that means that when I then I'm able to track what's happening in the debate and know who know as, as whip and know which strategy to be used. And I've been listening carefully and I know what's been said. And I tell my extensions, I tell my expansion speaker, I think we should go with plan B. They know what that plan B is. That shorthand is passed. 
which is very difficult to do during a debate, like writing notes even online these days or whispering them to your partner when, it, when it's face to face. It's very difficult to pass that amount of information in the amount of time that you have, right? So being able to do that quickly and succinctly by having that shared understanding means that we can facilitate these good interactions throughout the debate, meaning we're not likely to be surprised by what it is my extension gets up there and talks about, something that a lot of people seem to find that like, oh, I had no idea my extension was going to say this, and then I have to adapt to it. So we have a good understand strategic understanding before going in, we're listening to what happens, and we have good interactions throughout the debate to make sure that we're both aligned and make taking the right choices. Speaker roles. So, my first and really important note, and I think if you take anything from this, pr this presentation, this should be the thing that you take. You extend as a team, and it's not the member extending, okay? And note, I'm using the word member rather than extension speaker <laughs> specifically in order to try and break that conception of it is, the it is the member who brings the extension predominantly. There are, obviously, the member has to bring a bulk of the extension. So they have to bring the bottom line from the main logical links. But there is so much work in the extension that is done by the whip speak and so much work that can be done by the whip speaker. And if the member is being trying to do all of those things, then A, unclear to me what the whip speech is even supposed to do. But B, it just puts you at a huge strategic disadvantage. Because if you have seven minutes to win the debate and the other side has 14 minutes, they will beat you nine times out of 10. So, the, and the final thing here, WIP has to listen to their partner's speech and react to it. So ideally, happy flow, as we talked about, you've had this beautiful shared understanding, you've all listened very clearly to what happened in the debate, and you have a, you know, a lovely sh communication throughout the debate. So the WIP isn't surprised at all by what happens in, in, their, in the member speech. That doesn't always happen. And the WIP has to be listening intently to the member to be able to react and change their strategy during WIP accordingly in case they need to do so. Which means if your member suddenly said something that you didn't think they were gonna say, you need to adapt your speech and understand how do I take this new material and weaponize it? Or if you find that your member said things which you note that's already been said, i.e. they're not new material or anything else, then you need to be thinking about different ways to use the member's speech in order to win the either win the debate or win certain interactions inside the debate. You don't always have to get a first, a set, like, a second or a third gives you points. Points is what puts you up the table. That's all that really matters. And the final note here, if you are in CG, so as, as WIP, you're the only real person who can respond to CO. So you might need to dedicate significant time if they are a threat to do so. And please note and please do this. It's kind of basic, but again and again and again, you just see people ignoring CO, and it just means that like they will often end up losing to weaker cases because you just never responded. Proving your worth. So I've talked a lot a bit of, a lot now about like what it is in general, how you should set yourself up to do this, the kind of things you want to be thinking about, all of that. Let's talk about how proving your worth. So having an extension doesn't mean winning with your extension. And this kind of goes back to the top, what I talked about at the top, right? I.e. having new material is uh, is a necessary, but not, uh, but not, uh, 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 but not significant uh, 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 clause in order to win the debate. It's not enough to simply have the new material. You also need to be able to win with it. So step one is having an extension, new material being a starting point. And step two is making your extension necessary. And you don't want to rely on the judge figuring out the value of your case. So a lot of the time, and again, because we're human, we, we might think that it's so obvious why the arguments that we've said are better than the arguments that our opening said. Because I mean, like we thought of them and we're the best, right? But it, it's actually really, really important to spend additional time, not just giving this material, but explaining to the judge why it is that that material is better. And just note, <laughs> just saying, we gave stronger arguments is not an explanation as to why your material is better. You really need to approach that element of it the explanation, the meta of the speeches, explaining why it is that your material is better in the same way that you would approach explaining the improving the point to begin with. I.e., it's not just enough to prove that your point is correct. You also need to use the same analytical means that we use to prove a point to say why it is at this point is better than the other than your opening's points as well. And this is why the judge should assess it. 
There are different ways that you can do this. And I'm going to go through all of the different strategies now and the different ways that we kind of uh, go about extensions and explain how that might be done. So open, we're now going to talk about several different kind of extension strategies. All right. And as I mentioned, for each one of these extension strategies, we're going to go through what that extension strategy looks like, what are the pros and cons of using this kind of extension strategy, when we think it is strategically likely to use, when it will be successful to, to kind of win with, and what are the burdens that you need to meet in order to run this extension properly. And I'm going to note in each one of these different burdens, which of them can be done by the member and which can be done by the WIP. So you really notice that there is a huge amount of material that can be done by the WIP and that should be looked to be done by them if that's what's strategically prudent. So opening a new clash. So the pro here is that this is, so, so just as, sorry, to, to be clear what I mean here, this is when you come into a debate and you're saying, okay, opening have only been discussing one certain bit of this debate, like one certain bit of this debate. So it could mean that they're only discussing, i.e. they're only discussing the practical side of it and you're opening up like, I don't know, the moral side, but it can also be inside of this, i.e. it's like this complicated IR debate. They've only been talking about a certain subset of countries and you're now gonna open up a new subset of countries to be talked about. Or in an actor debate, they've only been talking about certain actors and you're now talking about a different type of actor, right? So all of these different kind of things can, can be opening a new clash. And this is kind of the most classic form of extension, right? It's the, it's the easiest way to appear new or fresh to a judge, i.e. That, um, that initial burden of like, I have to have something which is different, something that is beyond. It's very easy to meet in that kind of sense, yeah? Because it's very obvious what that is. The hard part of this is that it can be very hard with a strong opening team to actually run this. Because note, and we, this goes back to it. A new clash doesn't necessarily mean a winning clash. I've seen this a lot of times that people are very, very happy to kind of go, ah, we, we're, we're going to talk about this specific actor or this specific person. And it's, and it's very obvious that their opening has just taken all of the material that they wanted to talk about. So they're going to a tiny, tiny subset and talking about that in order to prevent something, present something which is new. But that's very, very rarely if the opening is strong, going to be necessarily the winning clash, right? Because probably your strong opening identified the stronger actors in the debate, the stronger meanings, and therefore it's not that easy to just come up with a new clash which is necessarily better than the others. So the strategy to kind of go ahead with this is what we talked about at the beginning, just prepping wide and broad, having a lot of different various ideas and directions to go in so that you can sort of pivot and move about them. The other thing that you need to be doing, obviously, is listening intently to see what it is of these, what it is of these various clashes have been already talked about by your opening and what really remains as new inside the debate. When are you likely to use this? So if open, you've reached the end of your opening, and you notice that your opening has, is winning all of the existing clashes, i.e. it would be quite difficult for you to then prevent an extension on the clashes which have already been discussed because opening has beat out their opposing team. This is mostly the case when you would say, strategically, it's probably prudent for me to try and open up a new clash here. Note that this is a decision that's gonna need to be made probably in the deputy of the speech, of the speech ahead of you. So you don't necessarily have a huge amount of time to do this. What are the burdens that need to be met in order to do this? So the first, and this is the obvious, is proving, is proving your material. And this is the kind of material that probably needs to, yes, exist in the member speech, i.e. the main logical links of your class, the explanation of it, all of that kind of stuff. It seems which probably the member needs to be doing. And if it comes in the whip, it's likely going to be too late, late because it will be new material. The other burden is proving and weighing your clash versus the clash or clashes already in the room. And this is the bit which very clearly the whip can do. And in most cases, this is going to be what decides if this, where you end up in the room, not just proving your material to begin with, but the actual weighing of that clash. And I put the word proving here, again, to just stress the need to use the same analytical tools that we use in other places to prove a point, to prove why it is that this is a more important point than somebody else's inside the room. There are various ways that that can be done. This goes back to the different meta that we talked about. 
But like part of the way that we sort of try and do this is we either try and look at what it is, the metric that the opening team has chosen in order to do their own weighing. And then we prove by, ha, by the same metric which the opening team has chosen, we can then show you why this clash is more important than others. Other times you might simply take this as the opposing team's metric, i.e. you can say, look, the opposing team have used this metric to judge, judge this, whereas we're using the, our clash wins by using the metric of the opposing team, which is actually better because that way you don't even need to decide between the two different metrics which have been proven in the room by opening house, meaning we have a clearer win than what's happening in our opening. So there are lots of different ways that you can approach this, but all of them require you to actively be engaged in the debate and actually prove the material that you're trying to do. Note that if you just do the first one, just proving your material, and this is where so many teams end up on this, ex uh, on this strategy, you, 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 you're not likely to beat your opening and you're not necessarily likely to beat your, to beat your diagonal. Okay, so it's really, really important to do this second part as well. This is the first strategy. I'm going to move on to the second one now. So this is extending an existing clash. It's also known as an analytical extension, right? So the pro here is that it is, so sorry, just to explain what I mean by that, by extending or an analytical extension. This means when you look at the clashes that have already come in the debate and you say, I am going to go deeper into a certain argument or into a certain clash that's already been said by the opening. And I'm going to provide material which is better than what's been already said in order to win this. OK, so that's kind of what we mean by going deeper inside this. So the pro here is that it's strategically cheapest. What does that mean? I mean, it doesn't require you to think necessarily of a whole new clash or a whole new argument. There is always more depth to be made in an argument, certainly when only seven minutes of speech can be said. Like, no argument can be given fully in the best way possible and withstand all attacks in seven or 14 minutes, right? So there's always going to be an option to go further here. So that's something which is always necessarily going to exist. And sometimes in shallower or more narrow debates, it's literally the only thing that you can do. Ideally, CA teams will not create debates, which are only allow one or two clashes. But hey, it's really difficult to always create debates. And sometimes CA teams mess up. Or sometimes we're just unable to think of these additional arguments that come about, which is why we would want to go for this analytical extension and why it's important that we train to do it as well. The con here is that it's the hardest type of extension to prove freshness. And by proof freshness, I mean right off the bat, when you come up there and you sound a lot like your opening, judges are going to shut off. I, I, I mean this really literally. Like if you start saying stuff, a lot of which sounds like your opening, and you're not ne you don't necessarily a acknowledge the fact that you're doing, say, an extension on that. So the judges need to be listening very clearly. So you, you're hinting to the judges, listen, I know I'm saying something which is very similar, but note there is going to be a difference here. So the judges pay attention. And B, that you stress the specific bits of your material which are new in order to make sure that the judges get them, to make sure that the wings get that, to make sure that it's very, very clear. And people are not just writing you off as repetitive or derivative of what come before. And it's obviously also hard to do this with an opening team as well. So what is the strategy? So here, when we talk, so inside prep, rather than sort of going and trying to say, I'm going to go as broad as possible, opening as many clashes, here I say, OK, I'm taking two, three, two, three clashes in the debate, and I'm going to try and go through as many links as possible inside that clash, as many responses and counter responses, in order to find all of the depth and stuff that's sort of gone on there. And then what you're tracking is unlike in the first round, like when you're going for a, uh, going for a, a, new, uh, a, new, a new clash extension, you're not looking at a tree, which is a tree of a bunch of new arguments and ticking them off as they're being said. You're looking at a tree of different links and you're ticking off the links as they are or are not proven inside the debate. And that's kind of what you want to be looking at here. So that's the kind of way that you prep for this during the prep room. And you want to make sure that the analysis that you're providing is not just new here, but also necessary. This is just like what we talked about earlier. It's not enough to have a new clash. It needs to be an important clash. It's not enough to have a new link. It has to be an important link. And here again, you need to be as charitable as possible to opening. Assume you might have missed something. Assume they might have said something slightly more. The more you disparage them actively, the less likely judges are going to take you seriously that you have something new to say. The more you're willing to give them credit, the more likely the judges are going to think that you are likely going to give something new and something different, which has already been said. 
When are you likely to use this? So A, your side is losing one or more clashes. And I think that it's really easy to notice that a very fun way to do this in a way which is easy to kind of circumvent a lot of the problems that I've talked about here is if your side has run one of the clashes and has been attacked extensively by the other side on it, then it is very easy to note what the hole is in their argument, right? Because the opposing side have pointed it out. And then very easy, and then you can, so long as you provide that answer, it is very clear to the judges why it is that you are above, going to be above the other team. And this is also a very helpful way, given that this is the main clash in the debate, to be above not just your opening, but your diagonal, i.e., Opening said X, they were attacked on this at this specific point by the opposing team, which is why the opposing team is beating them at this point in time. Here is the answer to that, right? And here, and therefore we are above not just the opening, but also the diagonal as well. So that again, a very kind of cheap way of kind of doing this. And if your side is losing one of the clashes, I would very much, I would very much recommend using this to kind of go forward. What are the burdens that we need to meet in order to do this? So first of all, you need to prove why this clash is not settled for your side, i.e. why is it even relevant that I begin talking about this to begin, to begin with? So this is something which, as I pointed out before, is better to use when it's very clear that the opposing team is beating your side on this specific clash. It's not always the case that this happens, and sometimes we might find the need to do this even if the opposing team hasn't attacked it, but it's obviously going to be much harder for us to do this. The second burden, it's how does your material settle this clash? Please note that this is important. This is the actual like analytical bit of the bit where you're not just saying here is a hole in the openings case, which has been pointed out by the opposing team, but here is the answer that I provide for it. I also want to note here in these two points, there's been kind of a trend which I've seen more and more, unfortunately, where I've seen members literally get up and provide rebuttal to their opening teams. Note that a good judge should just dismiss that material, like direct rebuttal to your opening, should by according to the rules of the game, just dismiss that material as if you were saying air, right? Because it, you are not allowed to rebut your opening team. You are allowed to use arguments that have been provided by the other side to show why it is that the other team is weaker. You can't provide new <laughs> reputation to the opening team and you certainly can't be as blatant about it as some people are today. The other thing that you need to be doing here if you're extending on a specific clash is if other clashes exist, why is this the most important clash? And again, this is the kind of thing that a whip can do. Note also the first point, why is this clash not settled for your side? The whip can do that because it's merely summing up what's happened inside the debate. However, I would recommend that the member take it on themselves to do that simply so the judges are turned on and understanding why it is they're hearing new information about something which they've already heard about. But if the member doesn't, the whip certainly can. And sometimes that strategic framing inside the whip is really what creates all of the difference inside the judge's head as well. So two of the burdens here, which the whip can take if necessary. Um, cool. So this is everything that has to do about extending an existing, extending an existing clash. The, the third one we're gonna be talking about is weighing existing clashes. So by weighing existing clashes, and this is one which I think is a little bit more complicated to do, and one that I find that people struggle with, is we're not necessarily trying to provide new material, uh, like new positive material or fill in a logical link or something like that. What we're trying to do, our extension is essentially providing a metric upon which we can judge the clashes that have already existed in the debate and therefore determine a winner. So it's a little more subtle, and it's a little more complicated, which is why I find that people often struggle to kind of do it. And it's not one that I see a lot of teams doing. However, very often it is the best way to kind of win a debate in the most strategic way possible. Because if you know that the first two, it's often very difficult to find this new argument that's never been said or this missing logical link or anything else. However, there is always a need to judge and weigh things inside of the debate. So this extension is always likely to be useful. It just needs to be done properly and with practice. So the pros, no need to think of new material. So a little bit tongue in cheek here, because obviously my point is that like, me, like the metrics and everything else are new material and it's really important to sort of note that, but there's no need to necessarily think of new analytical links or new, arg new whole new arguments. 
The biggest risk is that it exists, it, it risks sounding like a non-extension. And the risk here is really about the judging side of things. It's important that you flag to the judges again, what it is that you're doing so they understand that and you get that buy-in, that initial buy-in from the judges that they're not gonna shut off, but listen to you and go forward. I'm talking about this a lot about judges shutting off and all of this kind of stuff, because this is actually a real risk in debate. Like debates are judged by humans. Judges are humans and they have their own fallacies. And when people get up there and it seems like they're not saying anything new, people stop listening. Strategy. So you want to be thinking of clear math of clear metrics and multiple clashes and burdens in the debate, i.e. inside the prep room. So you've created what it is the various arg so the map that you're sort of creating is not just about it's not necessarily just like here are the arguments that we might run and here are the art. But it's much more, here are the clashes inside the debate, i.e. these are the various clashes that are going to sort of come across. Like this is what prop will say, this is what op will say. What are the different ways that these clashes could be, could be measured on? I.e. what are the various metrics that could be used in order to determine this? So what we're going to try and come up with inside prep, amongst other things, is not just here are new arguments, but here are several different metrics upon which the debate can be judged. OK, and this can kind of be like the kind of metrics that we're talking about here can be stuff like like the obvious stuff is like, oh, uh, like the, the basic utilitarian metric of like who gets harmed more. Cool. Various debates sometimes like lend themselves to other sort of metrics, which are much more important, but not necessarily everyone always thinks about them. So there are always there are kinds of when whenever we talk, say, about like the judicial system or stuff like that, there are other considerations that come into account rather than just like the utilitarian of like what is the best possible, like what is the best possible outcome, right? There are ideas here to see it's like, say, around justice or around other, like other sort of elements in society, which we think are important and upon which we could judge those debates. And like a schooling debate or stuff like that, the metrics often like stuff, the way that we think about education and what it is necessarily we're giving to individual people is not always necessarily just about what it is that it end, like what it is that creates a best thing for everybody in all society, but really what are the kind of giving to individual people themselves. So these are the kind of different metrics that we could sort of be thinking about and trying to pass during the debate, uh, during our prep, sorry. When are we likely to use? When there's been a lack of engagement between clashes and opening half. So this means, for instance, that like one side of the, like each side is kind of isolated and insulated inside what they're arguing about. There's not a lot of responses between the various arguments, opening or making arguments about in one sphere, uh, one sphere. their opposing team are making arguments in a different sphere, but they're not actually weighing up the impacts that each side has, i.e. here are harms and here are benefits, but no actual weighing or no actual direct engagement with that. As, uh, as that between the clashes. And this often happens, right? Because often there are good arguments for both sides. And the question is merely how do we weigh up and decide which of these two are the most important? So what are the burdens that we need to do here? So A, we need to show there's a low lack of engagement between the clashes. I.e., we need to show that it's not that the, the, the two sides have been debating in kind of an isolated point up until this point of time. The reason we need to do this is that we need to justify why it is that our metric is needed in order to determine a winner between the sides. Then we need to provide the metric upon which these two clashes can be weighed. I.e., we need to provide it and we need to prove it. Then we need to prove that this is the metric the debate should be judged on, i.e. it's not enough to say here is a metric we could judge the debate on. You need to explain and use the, your analytical arguments to explain why it is that that is the metric the debate should be judged on. And then, given that that's the metric, why the clash your bench is winning is more important based on that metric. So these are the various steps you need to take. And as you can see, it is more complicated to do and to just pull out of your hat than the other kind of things that we talked about, which is simply pointing to a missing bit of argument or a missing, uh, a missing clash, which has never been said in the debate. There's more subtlety here. But learning how to do this as well gives you another kind of tool to kind of use. And again, a lot of the burdens here can be hit by the whip, right? I.e., pro like proving, uh, like weighing, uh, weighing up the clashes given the metric. Obviously, the whip can do that. Showing a lack of engagement between the clashes. Again, the whip can do that. So there are a lot of different things here that the whip can do just inside this kind of sphere, which means that the member doesn't necessarily have to do them as well. So for instance, if the member has to do a lot of heavy engagement, then that can kind of give the whip the ability to do this. 
the final extension strategy that we're going to talk about is responsive extensions. So responsive extensions is when we're simply responding to the other team's arguments as they're being brought up. So the, the, this is, looks, a lot of the time people confuse this as simply, I only have refutation. Okay, now we'll talk about, I'll give us a, a second to note. If you only have refutation, i.e. you only have mitigatory arguments, then that's very difficult to win, right? Because the only thing that you can show is that they might not necessarily get the best, but you have no positive arguments on your side. However, a lot of the time it's enough to show harms, i.e. if your responses are not just mitigatory, but this is directly harmful, then this can often be enough to kind of create the arguments that you sort of want to do. So the pro here, it's very good for making sure you're at least beating the other bench, i.e. by having these kind of responsive arguments and being able to address all of the things that have been said and not just mitigate them, but show why their things are directly harmful, then it's very, very easy for you to show why you're above the other side. The, 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 the problem here is it needs explicit impacting versus opening, I, you need to really show why it is that the new arguments that you've brought and everything that's kind of been showed is actually is really important and to more important, say, than the positive argumentation brought by your opening team. And bad judges are going to miss it, i.e. bad judges will tell you you only had reputation, reputation isn't new material, blah, blah, blah. So again, you need to really be like outspoken about it, especially in WIP and say, look, our extension was to provide you all of these new responses to the case that has been said. They are necessary because look at all the damage that's being done. But be very, very, very explicit. This is what's being done. So the judges don't kind of dismiss it as simply not having an extension. The strategy here is to really focus on the other side during prep and come up with responses to their strongest material. Yeah, always kind of trying to think of what their strongest material is. And during the debate, try and inflate the challenges from the other side in order to build up why it is that your responses are so necessary and important inside the debate. And finally, as I said this, not just mitigate, but actually show direct harm. When are you likely to use? When there's a strong diagonal, i.e. when you have a very strong diagonal on the other side and by providing these sort of responses to it, you can really kick, you can really kick off. And the burdens, you need to show what the other side established, yeah? You need to show why this threat defeats your side so far. And then you need to show how you are uniquely responding. And almost all of this can be done by WIP to a great extent because this is responsive, because this is responsive arguments. Note if you fall into saying I'm giving a response, but it's actually a new argument, then judges will note that and tick that off and, and tick that off if that comes only in WIP. So note where it is that you're really providing direct responses, where it is that you're actually providing a different kind of extension, and make sure that that happens inside the member speech. Uh, and obviously, oh sorry, and obviously, how does your answer defeat the other team's claims? That that sort of goes without say. So uh, the, this flight of questions, but I want to kind of just sum up a second here before I go in and like open this up to all of the questions that you might have. All of what I've said here today, so I talked about four different strategies for extension. My actual thing is, this was done to simplify it by putting it inside a, in different slides. Most of the time, as uh, in, our, in our extension, we want to be doing two or three of these strategies, i.e. we'll be doing opening a new clash and also an analytical extension, or we'll also be being responsive and also doing weighing and meta. So we'll try and not just choose one of those strategies, but we might choose multiple of them in order to kind of do this, which also means that when we prep, we want to try and prep for multiple strategies as well. This just gives us more tools and more ability to probably win inside that debate rather than if we only chose one. And it also means that you have several different abilities inside your whip as well to prove why you've won this debate. So please don't be confused by the fact that I talked about four different strategies which you must choose between, because very, very often it will be a balance and you'll choose several of them and run them. Make sure that you don't try and run everything and run out of time, just like you would do an opening if you try and run every single argument and simply don't do it well enough. So that's my little cautionary tale. Uh, I'm gonna stop the sharing now and open it up to any questions that you might have. Um, so I see a question here in chat. Uh, yeah, and I will be sharing all of the PowerPoints later. And there is also some and 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 the recording of this uh, and the recording of this session.
so there's so duh, 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 about analytical extension. What do you think is the most persuasive way to flag out stuff missing from our opening? They have not proven X and Y, so we're going to prove you that straight up framing. What is the most pro to debate, or maybe some other options? So I, I, again, this goes back to the several different burdens that need to be hit here. So like the two different questions that you've asked, they've not proven X and Y. That's the first burden that I talked about, right? Which was showing that it even something which hasn't been discussed up till now, uh, sorry, which hasn't been proven. And then the second part of it is showing why that is crucial to winning. So really you need to do, like the answer is you need to do both because you need to hit both of those burdens. So as what I would probably do in, in, in extension is I would give a short sum up until that point of, we like this is as I, this is what's been said by our opening. The responses were given by this by the by the opposing team. There was no response to this, which means that this argument is not like this argument is currently being won, won by the by the opposing team, and therefore this new therefore we need to come in and, and bring in new material in order to solve this. You then bring in that new material, and then explain why it is that that has been like why it is that's close that clash. Your whip can then come in and do the different burden, which is explaining why it is that by winning that clash, you've won the debate as a whole. Any other questions, friends? Okay. Seem to be questionless. Um, so I'll just thank everyone very much uh, for joining this session. I hope it was helpful for you. Uh, we will be sharing both the PowerPoint and the like and the slides. Uh, and just like Madrid has a bunch of other really awesome uh, stuff planned for this week as well. So I really recommend joining that stuff uh, and try and learn as much as possible. Uh, everyone have a great day. Stay safe uh, and uh, see you soon. Bye.